You came and sent Jesus to die for us. So, Lord, I pray that at this time, we will not only rediscover who the church is, but rediscover who we are, Lord. I just thank you. I pray that you remove me. Lord, speak through me. I just love you so much. I pray that, Father, someone will be changed by hearing your word, the things you put on my heart, and the things you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So one of the first men I want us to look at is Simon Peter. See, Jesus changed his name to Peter, which means rock. And in the Gospels, we see Peter was anything but a rock. Amen? Amen. He was insecure. He was outspoken. He, was, he struggled with his faith. And he was very impulsive. So some of those examples are when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Here is Jesus speaking to Moses and Elijah in all their glory. And Peter, at the holiest moment, runs up. Hey, Jesus, Jesus, I want to go ahead and set up some tents for Elijah. And then you hear this booming voice come from heaven and say, This is my son, whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And I thought he was like, God himself had to say, Peter, zip it. Amen. So then we see um, Jesus was describing the events that happened and would lead up to his death, the things that were going to happen to them. And Peter pulls him aside and he starts to scold Jesus. Jesus, stop saying this. This is not going to happen. Jesus, I am here and I'm not going to let that happen. Jesus, come on, you're bringing the morale down. Don't you see the guys? And what did, what did Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Because, see, Peter wasn't thinking of the divine plan. Peter was thinking of a human plan. Amen. And then we see Peter in the garden. Jesus asked him three things. Three times, one thing, to pray. Amen. And three times, Peter fell asleep. Amen. And he told him, pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Amen. And Peter slept. And Peter tells him, Jesus, all may scatter and go, but I will never. Then we see his epic failure around the campfire, Amen. where he denies Christ not once, not twice, but three times. And then the roaster crows, and he remembers Jesus' words. So he goes down to an to a abandoned alley, and he falls to the ground and weeps bitterly. See, we find, then we find, we begin a book of Acts, and we find Peter and the disciples hiding in an upper room for fear of what the Jews might do to them. And then comes Jesus, and he's with them for 40 days, and he says, stay in Jerusalem, and you'll be filled with the power from the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit comes, and Peter is filled. And, and Peter rows out into the streets and starts preaching the very streets where Jesus was crucified. 3,000 new Christians were brought to the, into the kingdom through a man who a few months earlier denied that he even knew Christ. He was transformed from Simon, the disciple, into Peter, the apostle. And as Peter preached, it says people were astonished because he was an ordinary man. He was an unschooled and ordinary man. But then they took note he had been with Jesus. So as we further travel through the pages of Acts, we see another man. And that second man's name is Saul. Saul, in Acts 26, was arrested for being a troublemaker. They said he was constantly stirring up riots amongst the Jewish peoples, and they called him a cult, a ringleader of the cult, known as Nazarenes. He was constantly proclaiming this Jesus, who was dead, was now risen from the dead. And as he begins to share his testimony with King Agrippa, he says, From my youth, I was a strict Pharisee. See, I, I was a Jew and I was a Roman. I thought it, that it was my duty to oppose this Jesus of Nazareth. He said how he threw the believers into jail and how he hunted them down. He said whenever it came to a vote, I was the first to cast my vote to have them executed. And then one day, one day on this road to Damascus, 
He said that he was armed with papers from the Most High Priest. That meant he was on his way to make sure more believers were thrown into prisons, executed, and jailed. But he said a blaze of light shone, outshining the sun, and caused him and all the men with him to fall on their faces. And then he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the Lord replied, and he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light. To see the difference between God and Satan and choose God. I am sending you as to offer my sins, offer sins forgiven, a place in the family inviting them into the company of those who will begin a real living and believing in me. He says, what can I do, King Agrippa? I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. I began to be an obedient believer on the spot. Oh, hallelujah. He said, I, he said, I started preaching this life change, this radical turn to God and everything I meant in everyday life right there in Damascus, then in Judea, and then in Jerusalem. He said, and then, and to confirm the reality of this Jesus who appeared to him and who had changed his life. So I stand before you today, a man changed by love. I no longer wanted to be known as Saul the prosecutor, but as Paul the apostle, a servant of the Most High God. King Agrippa agreed that there was no clear evidence to charge him. And since Paul appeared, appealed his case to Caesar, they decided to send him to Rome, which would fill one of Paul's longings, his desires, the things that Paul would have put on his bucket list, was to go to Rome. In Romans 1, Paul writes, One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity to come to you at last to see you, for I long to visit you, so I can bring you some spiritual gift that may help you grow in the Lord. Paul would finally grow to Rome, the most powerful empire in the world at that time, but maybe not as he always planned, for he would go as a prisoner. So Paul and several of the prisoners set sail from Rome, and it's probably around November, the stormy season, and sailing on the Mediterranean stopped for the winter. But as soon as they set sail, the winds were against them. They found a larger Egyptian ship and they transferred them all onto that and transferred them on board. The winds continued to be against them and they finally made it to a place called Fair Havens, where there the weather was becoming increasingly dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall. And Paul spoke to the ship's officers and said this, men, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. He said shipwreck, loss of cargo, and possibly loss of lives. But the ship's captains, the officers, the other prisoners took a majority vote and the preacher lost. So they head out towards Phoenix. They were hit by an incredible storm called a Northeasterner. They lost all control of the ship, and it says by day three, they had to start throwing cargo overboard because the extra weight might put them under. Why does it take a storm to come in our life before we start clearing the deck of what's really important? You know, in the movie, The Bucket List, um, Edward never spoke to his daughter. He didn't have a relationship with her for years. And because he met this man who changed his life, he went and you see him reconciling with, this, with his daughter. You don't hear any words. And all of a sudden, you see a little four or five-year-old girl come running out and say the word mommy. And he bends down and realizes he just had a granddaughter. And then you see his hand crossing off the list. Kiss the most beautiful girl in the world. So why is it, why do we wait? Why do we wait until the storms come in to know what's, what's really important? See, I work for hospice, and I never saw anyone come in and say, Honey, can you park that car outside the window? Because I want to watch it on my last few days. Honey, can you bring in that picture of the house? No, but you know what I hear them say? Can you call my brother? Can you call that daughter who I didn't agree with the way she lived? And you, can you tell her so I can tell her I love her and I'm sorry? Why do we wait until it's too late? Clear the deck 
Come on now. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. You know yeah. what? You may never have that chance for that storm to come yes. in your life. On, you will be lucky if you have a chance to clear the deck. It's time today yes. why you have a chance. Amen. 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 I pray today that we don't wait till that storm hits, till our lives are tossed and turned upside down before we start thinking about what's really important. I pray today that we make a choice to clear the decks of the things that really don't belong there to begin with. That's right. In verse 20 it says this, And when the neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days, the storm continued raging, and we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And then 12, I'm thinking, he gives them, I told you so. If you had only listened to me, and I thought, how arrogant is that of Paul? And we know that's not unusual, Paul. Amen. <laughs> but as I started reading and I read it and I read it again, isn't it true that people, see Paul's saying, isn't it true that people can bring storms into our lives? It's something as simple as, honey, you know what? I, I got this new car for us without ever telling his spouse that he was going to get it. And now they're in this financial storm. And it's brought on because the other person decided that maybe you're in a marriage and a relationship and you love someone with all your heart, but they decided that you weren't enough or that they needed someone or something else, and now you're experiencing the storm of rejection and pain. So I believe that's what Paul was saying. Sometimes people can bring storms into our life. Amen? Yes. But listen, Paul's saying, but if you would have just listened, I love this, because he says, oh, but God. Oh, my God, when all hope is lost, when you're about, when you visited every church, and then finally you visit the last one, and you said, oh, my God. He says, Paul tells him, last night, an angel of the Lord, whom I serve, stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You're going to go to Rome. You're going to stand before Caesar. And as a matter of fact, Tell the men to keep up their courage because I have put them all in your hands and not a hair on their head will be, will be, will be hurt. So Paul, the angel tells him, and he says, but we must run aground and not end. And so they do, and exactly what God says happens, happens. They run aground an island called Malta. Malta meaning refuge. So the islanders are welcoming, and they're nice, and the Greek it means barbarians, and they didn't speak the language. They decide they're freezing cold from being in this weather, and in the cold, and in the water. So he decides, we're going to start a fire for them. And Paul, being the servant, servant of God that he is, he decides to go and collect some limbs and branches and place them on that fire. So as the islanders are watching, Paul is placing them on the fire. A snake comes out from the heat and attaches to his hand. So the islanders are watching, thinking, look at this man escaped the death of the sea, but now he's bit by the snake. He's going to die. He must be a murderer. The God of justice must have caught up with him. But i got to tell you, I just can imagine Paul left that snake hanging because he said, oh, no. Months. 
and he heals many of the people there. And then he arrives in Rome, and he ends up on house arrest for two years. So he says, he, of course, Paul gets out of house arrest, and then he's arrested a second time in Rome for, of course, preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then and once he's arrested, he writes, and as he's in prison in Rome, he writes to his spiritual son, Timothy. And he says this at the end of his life, probably just a month or two left to live. And he says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. That's right. That's right. It was like as if Paul was looking over that list, that bucket list he created. And you can see his hand crossing them off. I have, I have, I have finished. I, ha I have fought. I have finished. And I have, and I have completed. I've kept the faith. And as we close this series on rediscovering the church, I pray what you rediscover is who you are in Christ, as these men did. I pray that you know that scripture says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Amen. Yes. Don't you know that scripture said the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you? That scripture says that greater is he that is in you than is in the world. Don't you know that it says he can do exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ever